just such a pleasure to have you with us to come in and share in a conversation. And for anybody who's watching this who doesn't know who Cynthia Chung is, this is Matt Eretz's wife, and the two of them have founded the Rising Tide Foundation. And Matt also has his CanadianPatriot.org, and they've been quite the pair of historians and their insights on not only geopolitical issues, but just on some real common sense um, perspectives on things like the environment and the environmental issue. I think you guys really, your Limits to Growth uh, presentation was five star, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, just really blowing the lid off of some of those uh, uh, untruths out there about really what are the true limits to growth and and what um, options are still available that yeah it was fantastic and i do want to talk more about that with you at some point because mm -hmm. i think it's just so important to talk about right now but i'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> well no but it is all I'm, I'm curious for you cynthia is when when you're thinking i mean now that you shared a little bit here previously about your your education like when were you able then when you got back or when you moved back to montreal that you're th that you were able to grasp um like to read and to think again, because you were out of those other fields, right? Well, <clears throat> I always was a, a big reader um, since I was uh, very young. And um, so even though I was going through this period of time, which I think is almost impossible for anyone not to go through, which is to try to find yourself and what is meaning and therefore what is the rest of my life going to be oriented towards, um, <clears throat> that I was lucky that, um, I mean, scholastics in Quebec, this is a, a thing, right, where you, they have the books and, like, you get to order books. And this was, like, okay. Christmas for me. <laughs> I, I loved scholastics. That. I remember that exact, those things, and checking all the boxes and, like, taking yeah. them up here. Like, order me all of these. And they're yeah. like, and I'm like, yes. And then you get, like, the new book, and you're just like, yeah. ooh. <laughs> and everything is like, I was one of those maybe nerdy type kids but I mean what was really beautiful about these books was that it allowed you to enter this entire other world which was sure you could say it was like a, a fantastical world oftentimes you know for children and and like a, a maybe a bit of a dream world but at the same time had so much uh you know meaning for how you were going to live your life as well in the so-called reality, you know, hard reality. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes we're, we're lied to when we're saying, like, you need to be practical. You need to be about hard reality because what that really means is you're not going to be creative and you're just going to, like, take what you're given and you're going to go along that line. You're going to stay in that box or you're never you're going to just walk along that line and you're never going to look. Well, maybe I don't need to stay on this line. And um, it took me a really long time to figure that out, even though I was very drawn to uh, imagination and I was a very imaginative person um, because of the books, which were key to me developing that. So <clears throat> even though I, I was already all children um, have great imaginations, but we have to also exercise that imagination. Otherwise, we lose it when we become older and we think, oh, well, that was what children do. And it's like, no, that's what humans do. <laughs> and we lose that in the this world of hard reality that is actually not the real world. Because as soon as you exit that line, as soon as you step out of that box, you realize, oh my God, I was suffocating this entire time and I didn't even realize that there was an alternative to it. Um, and But the majority tell you that that is what is reality because the majority stay within that box or walk along that line. So um, for me, it was a really hard process to discover to do that. And I had to, spirit because spiritually I was not able to do that. Some people are for whatever reason. I was just getting worse and worse and, and not able to be functional in the sense that society was asking me to be uh, functional. And, uh, and it got to a point where the depression was so bad that I was like, I was still able to do school. School was still like easy enough for me. I was in university, but um, I was, you know, skipping my classes. I was still able to do well. My classes were recorded, but I was like increasingly not able to do um, really 
do very much. And I could I felt like my energy was just getting smaller and smaller. And there was only a matter of time until it would be snuffed out. Mm. And so at that point, it's like you have to kind of hit that spiritual bottom, like even though on the on the uh, the, the appearance of things, I'm in university, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still like a, 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 you know, someone who seems to have a future, I've already have a degree somewhere else. Um, it looks like I, I'm, there's nothing really wrong, because shouldn't you have to like, <clears throat> get out of university and maybe have like a few suicide attempts or drug overdoses before it gets really bad? And no, I don't think so. And I don't think I never would, I never would have gone that route. But you can spiritually kind of plummet um, in other ways. And so I had to kind of get there before I finally realized, like, it's not worth it. It's not worth trying to stay along this line in this box. And of course, you know, I have a Chinese mother. So that's especially, you know, (laughs) the Chinese mothers are very practicality, number one, good job, you know, number one, uh, stability. And I get it because they went through a tough time um, where stability was really, you know, thought to be the best thing in the world for you. Um, But, you know, in a world where you're born with stability, spirituality is really what is going to nurture you at that point. And if you don't have um, food for the soul, so to speak, you're going to starve and you're going to you're going to die. So um, for me, I had to basically take um, um, that choice for myself. So even though I was kind of along that route, I started to set my priorities in different directions. And um, I was lucky enough to to meet Matt. And um, I I had um, an introduction to basically um, focusing on uh, Plato actually was my my first really real introduction on how to think properly. So I had like a lot of good instincts or intuitions, but I had no way of putting it into a structure or to go, okay, I have these proper questions, but I don't know now how to go about a method to go further than that and and seek answers to those questions. And so the platonic method was really crucial. And it's it's still, it's, it's crucial. This is like my my operating system is basically uh, the platonic method. And uh, for those out there who have heard slanders of Plato, just read Plato, read the Gorgias, okay? Like just surprise, surprise, like read the person instead of the Wikipedia summary or whatever. Because oftentimes too, you'll see um, like this trench that a lot of um, good people, their biographers are people who hate them. Yes. I've noticed that is a very common thing for good people. The, the biographers who take over their life legacy are actually people who hate them. And I've seen that for Cicero as well. He's been attacked that way. Um, Edgar Poe has been attacked that way in a very clear way. Uh, Rufus Griswold was a clear enemy of his and then acquired all of his works after he died. And wow. there is a lot of... Um, suspicion that these uh, works have actually been, you know, fooled around with a little bit as well. So, um, yeah, just read Plato. Um, He is not for promoting dictatorship or fascism or anything like that. And in the case of the Republic, it's a tough one because he's taking you through a mental exercise where you take it from the standpoint, if I were, and every citizen should do this, right? Because if you want to be in if you want to have some influence or you want to be in a democracy, so you have a say as to what is good and bad actions of your country and your, your government, that also means you have to think a little bit, well, what is the government I want to see? It's not so easy, right? Like, let's say I were in position of the person in charge. I was the president um, or in the case of Plato, right? I was like, you know, the king or, or whatnot um, in a lot of areas of the world, not not Athens. They didn't have a king at that point. Um, and so you have to ask these basic questions of like, well, you have your idea of morality, first of all. Well, what is, why is that the right idea of morality? And OK, let's say that is an OK morality. How are you going to? enforce that morality and so he's taking us through all of these channels but he's talking to people he's leading them you know to to ask these questions for themselves he's not just saying this is what i think now you spread the word so a lot of these things that of it being like a mental experiment that is basically in reflection of the younger people he's talking to not him 
um, and stuff that they have to figure out for themselves is that uh, people have taken these things out of context saying that, well, Plato just, uh, you know, made that as a conclusion and so forth. But if you were, I find The Republic is actually a very challenging book. And if you don't know Plato, you should not read The Republic first. You should read his other dialogues first. And The Gorgias is probably the, the um, best introduction to a platonic dialogue where he clearly is a, a, a criticizing dictatorship tyranny, um, fascism of, of this uh, sense that he's often criticized for. You know, it's interesting, too. A lot of people might not realize, if they don't know the classics, how Plato was so influenced by Socrates, and that's where mm -hmm. the Socratic yes. method came from. And also, right. just yes. a plug for the Rising Tide Foundation, you can go to their digital library of Alexandria, mm -hmm. and there you can find all those dialogues by Plato, and that is a, just a really good place to study right at home on your mm -hmm. app or computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're we do readings every Wednesday, and um, in a <clears throat> in the near, we've already done one reading of Plato's Phaedo, which you can also find on the Rising Tide page under workshops. But um, we're going to do another reading of another uh, pl Platonic dialogue. And yes, just for people to be aware, all of the Platonic dialogues are based off of Socrates. Socrates is the character, not Plato, but Plato is the writer. And um, and uh, yeah, we're going to do another dialogue. So that'll be a lot of fun because I haven't read it in a group session in a while. And it's the best. It's the best experience. Yeah, we really see the way you light up when you said Plato was my introduction to how to think. What a what an awesome place to start. Is that yeah. partly due because of Matt's influence at the time or your own discovery? Well, um, it was the well we had met uh i met matt because he was organizing in montreal on on the streets and it was affiliated at the time with the larouche organization and um i was never like super close with it but um matt but they have a lot of very good ideas that yeah. to this day i think are, are are very um essential um in terms of like uh large policies that countries should be looking at basically. But there's also a lot of good history work as well. And there was a, a certain potential at one point that they could have set up a, a decent curriculum, which is what we ultimately want to do as well, right? Is like, because oh, the schools so. right now are not teaching things that, I mean, if people were just introduced to these things, like I said, right, I didn't know how to think until I was introduced to Plato. There are, there are tools that we can have so that we can, we can tame all of these surge of thoughts and everything. Otherwise, you know, it's like, think about what your thoughts were before language, right? You need that already to structure something and go somewhere, right? Like, it's not like you wouldn't have thoughts without language, but your, your thoughts are so much more structured and organized, but it's not just that, you know, like you need a methodology of how you approach your questions and how you approach, um, you know, any kind of uh, conflict or dilemma that, that you're going through even spiritually as well. You need uh, tools for these things. And so um, people uh, have largely thought that that's just, you know, experience or your emotions are what are going to naturally tune you and emotions are part of it, but that's not going to, you know, be a good navigating device on, on your ship as you're sailing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, so Matt was really for me, um, what a lot, cause he would do readings with me and he was also working things out, but he was like slightly already further introduced into to Plato and things like this. And so his, uh, his uh, approach to teaching was really what um, resonated with me. So even though the, the LaRouche organization had a lot of good suggestions for things, it was really Matt's teaching that um, uh, made me st stick with uh, uh, some of these things. And also, I liked reading anyway, to my credit. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like um, that kind of... And he also was... Um, he, he had a way to challenge me that I wasn't offended. And at the time, there was a certain way, right, where it's like, um, you know, there were some people who tend to be a little bit moralizing or preachy, whereas Matt had a way of challenging me. He knew kind of something that I was like hiding <laughs> under that I was like pretending wasn't really there. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, what, 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 what's, what's, what's that? You know, it's like, nothing. <laughs> it's like, uh, you want to talk about it? It's like, no. <laughs> 
So he was very good at like, you know, that kind of a approach and uh, we would have arguments and everything, but ultimately I'm, I'm such a better person because of him being um, in many ways, like my first real teacher, which sounds weird, but um, we have a, we have a very, you know, balanced, I, it's not like I call him teacher now, but you know, he was my teacher at the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's really sweet. So once you had this new approach to thinking, right? So you're and you're, you're studying Plato. Um, where did you go next in terms of, of like what did you want to investigate first in your in your mind? Like now that you had some sort of way of processing the information, what kinds of like where did you go next before you know you you just started delving into various topics? Was there something that was really kind of that got inside and just lit you up? The, the arts. Um, so I, philosophy was always a, a favorite subject of mine, even before I knew Plato. And that's why I was actually really upset that I didn't really come to know Plato until my mid twenties. And I was like, because, you know, when I was younger, I was searching for classics. I would actually go into Google. I'm like, Google, please tell me which classical books are the best books to read. And they sent me a, a list of existentialists, like super depressive stuff you know from like the lost generation and and everything like Albert Camus and stuff like that um the Tropic of Cancer Ernest Hemingway I read them all and I was like I feel sick <laughs> and uh and so I was so upset that I was only introduced to Plato um in my mid-20s because they don't talk they don't want people to read into these things right and everyone knows Shakespeare but you know, Shakespeare is not the easiest thing to just like uh, get into right away. Um, so I always liked philosophy. But then um, Schiller, Friedrich Schiller was the next big name for me. And he is a playwright. Um, and uh, his, his plays are very beautiful. And also his, his essays are very beautiful. And there's been some operas that have been made um, based off of his play. Um, uh, the one on Marquis of Poza, um, Don Carlos is a, is a play. Um, Verdi actually did a, a few plays off of, I think Made of Orleans by Joan of Arc is also a Verdi play that um, was done. Verdi was very good at taking just Shakespeare, and he also took a lot of Schiller, because Schiller is the kind of uh, German Shakespeare of Germany. Um, and he would, Verdi was like awesome at how much he was able to put out in, in the opera scene. Um, like, and he was like kind of mainstream, like everybody was singing his songs like they're the top, you know, you know, 10 on the charts kind of thing. But it was also uh, a way to really educate people and, and you know, make it, make it, um, uh, more of a, you know, it's always best to have fun when you're learning kind of thing. And uh, so Friedrich Schiller was my next one. And he has, um, he has very, uh, he has a very light way of approaching how to, um, you know, basically try to become a better person without it being a Kantian way where you feel like you have to whip yourself or, you know, you, you feel like you have to shame yourself. It's like, oh, I broke it again you know, I, I'm such a, you know, whatever. Um, whereas he was saying that um, there is a way for you to work on yourself such that you can naturally be in harmony right. such when you're becoming a better person. And it's not a feeling of deprivation, right, that you're right. depriving yourself of this or that bad thing that you've been told or you have identified as a bad thing, but rather that you are naturally, because you're cultivating your senses better, you are naturally saying, I don't want it. I don't, I don't need it or I don't want it because it's actually not something that I feel I would, I would benefit from. Uh, or, you know, like, you know, when someone is, uh, has more of a, a healthy um, body, their body will tell them in a much more quick way, oh, I just ate something and made me feel sick. Like, let's say, like really greasy fries. For a healthy person to eat a whole bunch of greasy fries, they're going to be like, wow, I feel really sick. I should not have done that. And they won't they won't do it again um, because it was bad for their body. Um, whereas someone who's been eating badly for a very long time, they're going to eat those fries and they're probably going to be like, I liked that. That was great. But I should not have done it. <laughs> and uh, that's the difference, right, is that you're you're you are not sensitized anymore to what is bad for uh, for you. 
And culture, our culture is a big uh, part of that where it has desensitized people's ability spiritually to realize, oh, that just made me feel spiritually sick. I should not have done that. Right. Yeah. Guilt, blame and shame. That's a wicked triangle. And obviously it filters through so many of the dogmatic uh, religions for sure. I mean, I was definitely raised with some of it. And how do you get rid of the Catholic guilt? You know, you get over it. You stick it, you know, you basically send it on its way. You place it with joy and with love and true love. You know, like when you're talking about the the nurturing or the cultivating of of the mind in different ways, if you do it from a place of nurturing, then you never even have to lose your innocence or your love for learning. If you're cultivating mm-hmm. and nurturing yourself and even others at times, but I think a lot of times people forget to nurture themselves with the love needed so that their innocence stays intact. You know, some mm-hmm. might call the little boy or the little girl inside us or however you might see that. But I think there's the, the nurturing aspect that gets taken out because the culture doesn't allow for that kind of nurturing. It almost would rather just kind of take care of you in a, in, in a real kind of distorted sort of way. Well, yeah, it's like it's what you were saying in your your right. the first part of your Huxley series, where the it's not about truth and knowledge and love and beauty. It's about comfort and happiness. And here, we're, we're, you've got this problem right. going on, being Sushi. being told what the problem is, as opposed to really identifying right. what the true societal issues are, and yeah. how we are, uh, you know that nurturing that you were talking about it it's it's the nurturing of the creativity of the imagination that the culture drives out of us you know i i can relate i i remember being a kid and just even being told i'm asking too many questions well why are we discouraging children from asking those questions we want people to continue to ask be asking questions their entire lives so that they're not just eating what they're being fed which is obviously all around us right now yeah, and I mean, that was one of the no-nos of uh, Mustafa Mond and the Brave New World was to ask too many questions because <clears throat> that person is clearly going to be oriented towards change. <laughs> because part of the, uh, po- it's not just to understand when you're asking questions, but it's also to to understand in order to, to help, you know, facilitate or help correct as well is the underlying um you know uh, intention behind those things which are good intentions um but that's why you know there's that, that scene where mustafa moan just correcting whatever scientific paper and he says like oh this actually uh might be a very big you know discovery that this person has made but um we can't uh, accept it because it's going to disrupt the status quo too much and so we're going to have to get rid of it and that's exactly how our world functions right now um, uh, you know in the sciences right now it's, it's very sad because the sciences are increasingly and technology is being increasingly seen as something that is like just inherently evil and bad but what they have to realize is that um, Everything that is in especially the American matrix, but or like the, the Western matrix, is um, it's, it's being governed by the military industrial complex at this point. Like the education system, especially if you're in the sciences, you work for the American military industrial complex, whether you realize it or not. And if you're one of the brilliant people in your field, you will probably get to realize that very quickly that you you are working for it. You know, like we we know um, certain really great scientists um, actually in 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 contact with us, and they had no choice but to work for Lockheed Martin if they right. wanted to continue with right. their with their projects. And their projects they're completely oriented in a way where this is not a military industrial complex vision that they have, and they're doing real science, which is going to have like amazing benefits for people but at the end of the day Lockheed Martin owns that work and Lockheed Martin gets to decide what happens to that work and you won't be able to get funding anywhere else because even if you were to have let's say uh, a rich benefactor that person probably depending on how big of a uh, you know a project you're working on 
they will play dirty, you know, in these kinds of situations, unless this billionaire has like a whole thing to protect themselves and your project, it's, it's not going to be able to withstand, you know, the kind of intimidation and pressure that comes um, with the military industrial complex. So that's the very sad reality of our world. Plus, like what we were bringing up as well before, this uh, this false uh, teaching of what are the limits of growth, which is also part of the false teaching of what is our nature um, as well. Because we're not taught that like one of the key resources in the world is our mind. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're talking about limited resources. It's like, hey, maybe for you, buddy, you've got the limited resources yes, in the yes. clunker up there. <laughs> they have to be, keep pumping that scarcity model. I mean, it's been going on for hundreds of years. There's not enough of this. There's not enough of that. We're going to run out of this. We're going to run out of that. You know, it's survival of the fittest. Like, only the fit survive, and everybody else is just going to die, and that's just part of nature, and we're beasts, and we're the problem. Like, it's so, it's so old. I, I just wish that more people could see the pattern, like, right? I mean, that's why we study people yeah, like Huxley see. and Wells and all these people that planted the seeds that were, that were dealing with the, the bad fruit right now. And if we don't start to take control of our minds, then how else, like, how else do we exemplify bravery? To me, if you sum it up, us taking control of our minds is being brave in this new world that we currently live in. I'm, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what, maybe what Huxley's bravery was versus what you think true bravery is. Courage. Yeah, I, think, um, <clears throat> I think that maybe what I'll do is I'll just do a quick summary for people who haven't read the series and they can find it on uh, Through a Glass Darkly, um, my Substack page. Um, and the, the first one is, um, I think, uh, Who Will Be Brave in Huxley's uh, New World? That's the first one. It's a four-part series. And um, one thing that people have to realize about Huxley, Aldous Huxley is that um, his grandfather, T.H. Huxley, um, is pretty, I mean, Darwin is the, the, the person who put forth the theory of, uh, of uh, Darwinism, but it was T.H. Huxley who was the bulldog of Darwin, as he called himself, uh, who promoted it because um, at the time there were a lot of theories that were going on for evolution. It wasn't just Darwin and we're kind of taught like it was just the, like, the, the creationists or it was Darwin. But no, there were actually a lot of people in the field of evolution, and Darwin's theory of evolution was the most incompetent of all of them, to the point where he couldn't even win in debates, and he needed to teach Huxley to do uh, that for him, um, so that you know there's a certain skill of debate. But um, because these scientists who maybe are not used to debate, they are right. But because they don't know how to argue with some of the kind of cheap tricks that can happen in a debate, they can they can look like they're losing to an audience that doesn't understand what the subject is. And that's the topic of sophistry that Plato also deals with, which really infected ancient Athens at the time, is that the person with the better argument, not necessarily more knowledge or understanding of the subject, is the person who wins. So, um, you know, at the time, uh, Dwight Dana was a, actually an American um, evolutionist that w had a much uh, better theory of evolution, which was that evolution was uh, heading in a direction, it was purposeful, and it was towards greater de degrees of cephalization, which is, I wouldn't regard that as just like the brain, although he was looking at the nervous system, but just this higher consciousness of thought. And um, whereas Darwin was concluding that things were random in their mutations and that you had this natural selection upon them. But when you look at Darwin's theory, it's quite absurd because uh, if you look at just like biochemistry, for instance, and all of the, um, the things that would need to change from an evolutionary a molecular evolutionary standpoint, right? You would have to have this chemical process and this chemical process and this chemical process all randomly change at such that it was superior all at the same time. Like the, the probability of all of these things happening within your body in yeah. such a way, because you know, like to get a beneficial mutation by chance is already, it's very, very unlikely. And um, <clears throat> it's usually many, many years before. So it's not just like, 
you know, people kind of oversimplify it, uh, the evolution of the eye or whatever, but it's also the molecular processes in your body. If you were to look at this from the molecular level, especially, it makes no sense. You would never have gone anywhere and you'd, we would much more likely have mutants all the time because the, the things would not be compatible with other parts of your body that didn't um, change along with it. We would much more likely become more mutated over the years rather than to become, um, to have an improvement. But T.H. Huxley wanted to, T.H. Huxley who did not even believe in Darwin and he said so, <laughs> which is bizarre. Um, he promoted Darwin because it was along the lines of what um, the empire needed for a, a slave um, caste system. And so that is the reality, folks. Sorry to break it to you. But um, the number one lessons were to not believe in um, a god or a creator, right? A benevolent creator. And uh, to, to view that all purpose, there is no purpose. It's all random. Um, and thus, we have no meaning in our lives either. And we are uh, we are akin to beasts, and thus we're not we have no sacredness um, in us. We we are more like the law of the jungle than anything that could partake in the sacred. Um, and um, and so obviously, you know, this overall lesson of like you can't really know truth became a real theme in the 20th century, which was never. Nobody ever thought that way. And people have to realize, too, that scientists, you know, back in the day up until the 20th century um, were oftentimes religious, um, leading scientists, OK, like Leibniz uh, and, uh, and, and, and many others, um, Christian Huygens. Um, uh, I'm so bad with like remembering names. But anyway, the, you look at all of them and they're like they're, they're very Christian, you know, the European scientists. And they're, they're, it's not um, it's not like, oh, well, that was because of like whatever kind of cultural baggage or, or like the, the world was moving out of that, though. And now things are so much better. Science is so much better. Science is not better. And, um, you know, even the recent uh, I forgot what this James uh, Webb telescope or it's 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 oh. now uh, yeah, starting to uh, challenge the Big Bang theory. Right. And it just goes to show that these scientists who thought they were hot shit for this whole time, um, <laughs> they are now on record. A lot of these scientists saying, like, I think I might have wasted my entire life on a false idea of how, you know, space, uh, in other words, the heavens function. Um, and so people really need to realize that um, this approach to science that has cut out uh, an idea of purpose and also you know, a, a purpose of intention, but not only that, a loving purpose and intention, um, and that we can partake in the sacred. Our minds are, are actually in tune. The reason why we can think of subjects like eternity um, is, or, you know, light years. These are not uh, things that are physically tangible that we're told in science, oh, we can only, you know, fidget with physically tangible things and with our sense perception. Well, then why do we have a concept of eternity and light years? And why do we uh, have to even talk about light years, you know, in context of these very big things. Um, you can't get uh, away from it at a certain point. You have to acknowledge that there's something else that our mind is capable of doing that we are in tune with. And it, we are in tune because we were we were built by that system. You know, science today, it teaches you to look at something as if you were not a part of the same world. We are a part of the same world. We're not like some like alien looking at a globe, you know, like all these things, you know. So we are a reflection of that that own world. And and uh, especially when we're talking about these these big subjects, the universe is not a cult thing. Um, we've been told these things because well, how do you feel, you know, when you're told that the universe is cold and you know, a lot of these uh, movies, these horror movies that that try to show you, it's like it's so cold and dark and and, and like the boogie monster is going to come out of your bed uh, kind of thing. And uh, when you actually look at what um, the heavens look like, especially with these colored pictures, and the reason why uh, we don't see it is because our eye can only see certain wavelengths. 
That's not reality though, okay? So like there's so many more wavelengths of light that our eyes are not able to see. And when you're given, when an instrument is able to translate that to you, you're like, holy shit. It's like, it's not in like an acid dream or anything, but it's almost like that, right? It's like, there's just like colors and everything. And there's all types of like nebulas and things that are growing out of each other. And it's, it's a living process. Things are growing and changing. And we, you know, we're finally starting to see that with this uh, new development, which is, is it the James Webb? Is that what it's called? I think it was. I, I remember seeing it. I didn't read the, the full article. Yeah. I don't want to Matt, go Matt did a, a recent um, uh, thing on his Substack on it. Uh, but yeah, there there was a recent, um, you know, uh, pictures that we're being able to, to be taken from a very large distance that show actually that what we're seeing there completely contradicts the, the Big Bang Theory. And, you know, that was one of the theories of these um, entropists who think that, you know, we're in an entropic world. That's also not true. Um, that uh, these the only way a galaxy gets bigger is by eating another galaxy. And I remember watching this YouTube video to try to explain this to me. Um, and it seriously felt like um, a nature documentary of like the deep ocean, you know, where you see like really scary creatures in the deep ocean. It's like, and so Andromeda comes and gets, you know, devours its prey. It's like the David Attenwood uh, accent or whatever. And it's like, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work that way. I was like, wow, <laughs> but th this yeah, is what is think, science right now. <laughs> Cynthia, do you think that uh, T.H. Huxley and those and, and the circles that he was mixing in in that time, were they, like you said, he didn't believe in Darwin, but obviously they saw a value to use what he had put forward, right? So then there were what? these elite clubs, what, Fabian Society type clubs? Is that what was starting to form at that time? That was then, I guess what I'm wondering is like, well, who was influencing Oxley? Well, obviously it was the elites. Well, then where did they all meet? They probably met in places like that, right? That's where those round table groups even eventually emerged out of, I do believe. Yeah, the, Matt has done a lot of uh, good work on the, the round table. And, um, you know, I've done an article on um, addressing the Fabian Society, which, which their motto is even a uh, wolf in sheep's clothing. And their crest was a wolf wearing right. sheep That's fur. Funny. Not in a very convincing way, by the way. <laughs> it was like <laughs> clearly a wolf wearing right. a, a much hey, smaller size know? animal's fur <laughs> on it and walking around like, I'm a sheep. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> yeah, they have these kind of techniques, which I think, you know, it's, it's a lot for people to get into um, maybe for just this conversation. But, um, you know, you can read our, our material. But ultimately, it was um, it was in discussion of like, what would be because the, the British Empire was losing and, you know, they were uh, horrified that there was also a population boom from the industrial growth. But how they see this is um, <clears throat> that they're going to lose control as well, right? Because if science gets too unhinged um, in the sense that it's benefiting people's livelihood and they're able to support themselves. Um, and, you know, if you look at a lot of the type of geopolitical and economic uh, type partnerships that were forming in the, the 19th century, the British Empire's um, uh, hegemony was in real big trouble. And I did uh, an article on this called Why Russia Saved the United States, Absolutely. which goes through, you know, Germany, Japan, yeah. Russia, China, the United States, um, and other countries as well. But those are big names. We're all uh, really becoming close with the same economic vision. Um, Tsar Alexander II and Lincoln, you know, they were both assassinated. There were uh, Sun Yat-sen from China was uh, forced to step down because of the British and uh, Japan and Germany. Well, the reason this is what I believe is why we went into the World War was to separate these countries. And uh, we've we've been always told, like, you can't be friends with certain countries. If you've noticed the pattern for all of the 20th century, we're just constantly being told you can't be friends with that country. Um, so that was a big part of the Roundtable Fabian Society, which is a very big subject. And if you want to look at it, there's tons of stuff on, on Matt Eretz's uh, Substack page. And I do a bit of that stuff, too, on the Fabian Society on my page. But um, so, yeah, that was the big thing is that what Darwinism 
accomplished was to form this modern science that projected the concept of a creator uh, of God, of intention, of purpose. And so science now is to be reduced to sense perception type things. And that was going to be a much more controllable thing for the oligarchy. It wasn't going to be out of the control type discoveries that would constantly be challenging why they think that they have to keep you down this way or you know, because they're always telling us horror stories, right? There are these like scary stories for children. But then when you make these uh, scientific discoveries, you're like, wait a minute, it's not so scary, actually. The, I, I, I understand now how it works. Um, and the other thing for the, the, the masses was really this idea that you can't partake in the sacred. And thus the number one um, priority in your life should just be comfort a form of comfort and happiness, a sensual happiness. And Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, he makes that very clear, right? It's all about just gratifying your base senses, right? Because there is a hierarchy of sensuality. It's not to say, oh, because, uh, you know, you're a moral person, it means you have no sensuality or something like that. You have the base sensuality, which you see like at Las Vegas and the, those types of places. And then you have other types of uh, higher sensuality, which also partake actually in love. The higher forms of sensuality partake in love. Um, and so we were only told that we could have that low base world um, because we're animals um, and there's no truth. Um, but if there is, or if there is truth, we can't know it, you know? Well, there um, is yeah, I, I pulled this one quote. I think it was from um, your first jam for, with Mel Kay, because I just think you said it so well. So it's, you said, whenever one discovers a universal truth, it unifies re rather than divides. Truth is thus the very enemy of tyranny, for it offers clarity. And, no, and one can no longer be ruled over when they can see a superior alternative to their oppression. Therefore, under the rule of tyranny, truth must be must truth must when possible be snuffed out otherwise it is contorted until it is no longer recognizable it is broken into fragments of itself in order to create factions schools of opposing thought that are meant to confuse and lead its father followers further astray and it's just yeah. true it's like it's you just described exactly what's going on right now and why there is so much confusion and lack of understanding of what really is going on yeah, and that, that's very much the specialization of the Fabian Society to do these types of uh, techniques, which um, I, I, in my research, I feel that the, the Trotskyists actually learned a lot from the Fabian Society, and the Fabian Society is not separate from the Trotskyists, and if you think that that sounds crazy, you can read my paper on it. Yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's exactly it. If we don't believe in a, a, har a harmon, um, uh, harmony, uh, a harmonic <laughs> unified whole, then we will automatically think that, you know, it's it's about um, your emotional disposition. And that's also why we're kind of like a in a Babel, uh, Tower of Babel kind of situation, because everyone's kind of like, well, my reality is based off of my emotional disposition, and you're not being sensitive to that. This is going to only further divide people. That's an impossible situation to to make you know function, and um, people have to realize that: Are you being sensitive <laughs> to other people's sides, or are you just like focusing on your own? Like, because that's never that's cut you off from everything. And maybe, maybe you have something to learn. That's, <laughs> it's not just the other person who has something to learn. Um, you cut yourself off from learning. You've, you've crippled yourself because everybody has to learn up until their last, you know, breath. You have to learn. Nobody is born, you know, with just, and your emotions are not some kind of moral compass. Your emotions are something that need to still be cultivated by what, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, a healthy spiritual core. Nice. Um, and, uh, and so... Yeah, so I mean, in this in that paper, I go a little bit on um, you know Bertrand Russell's role as well in all this, but I think that you know people can read the paper if they want more information. But um, you know, basically, Teach Huxley's um, son, I forgot now his uh, first name, but he also did a little bit of work on this, and he uh, was the one that went further and said there's no such thing as a soul. 
Ooh. And that was a big uh, contribution that started to be accepted mm. now in the modern science as well, is that we don't have a soul as as well. And uh, and then you have Aldous and Julian Huxley who are born into this sort of environment. And uh, with T.H. Huxley being like the godhead. And this family was put under, like uh, Aldous and Julian were put under an immense amount of pressure. And their, their middle sibling actually hung himself um, on the grounds of, uh, on a tree and they didn't find him until a few days later and uh huxley aldous um uh, is said because he ended up losing a, a large chunk of his sight and so he couldn't really compete you know julian was the golden child and um he couldn't really compete in the same way um and he had now an excuse anyway with uh, his uh, his sight being drastically uh, decreased and there was a little bit of relief from aldous because he was like, I have a little bit of breathing room and space now um, because of this. And he was able to look into things that were a lot more, um, you know, I guess you could say philosophical and, um, and introspective and, and things like that. Whereas Julian uh, increasingly, you know, with the work with H.G. Wells and stuff was becoming a leader in the, the eugenics movement and finding out ways through UNESCO and things like this. He wrote the manifesto, he's the first director of how to um, orient society to accept eugenics at a certain point. He was the president and vice president of the British Eugenics Society as well, Julian. Um, so it runs in the family quite consistently. And so there's this question of like, well, what about Aldous? And the, the quick answer to this in um, the part two of this paper is that he wrote a paper, um, I think the year before uh, The Brave New World, calling for eugenics um, on people, especially uh, the, the mentally retarded. And, you know, his father would say, um, the people who who are um, handicapped in whatever what whatever way in their view, and that could also you know extend to having an addiction, even a gambling addiction or whatever, right? Or you can't pay you can't pay your debt. That might also in their view be like a sign that you you are you are problematic and you should be youth, not euthanized but sterilized. Um, it, it, it's quite a, a big general field here that you could see could increase quite a bit. Um, and uh, and the, it was just the thought that these people didn't have rights like a normal person does. So it would be wrong to try to do this to a normal person, but these are not normal people and thus they don't have rights. And when you don't have a concept of the soul, you can increasingly justify that people be treated like animals, which was increasingly what was being hap was happening. You were very literally a cattle <laughs> now with this view. So people who uh, stand by this view, you're standing by a slave caste system um, belief because there is a hierarchy, you know, and uh, you're also going along with us, I, this idea that you are just a beast on someone's field that, that owns you and gets to decide what to do with you uh, ultimately. Um, and that's kind of the next logical step from separating uh, science and religion, right? First, you know, you take out the larger purpose or larger creative force, and then you take out the individual soul, and then the individual has no power, and then what are you left with, right? Oh, the government to take care of you. Yeah, and no coincidence, right? Like once uh, T.H. Huxley uh, set up the modern science with Darwin, H.G. Wells wanted to call for the modern religion, and in his open conspiracy, he says, you know, he, he wrote uh, the three books, which are super long. Um, I, I, I have a hard time remembering all of their names. One of them is uh, The Life of Sciences or something like that. He co-wrote with Julian Huxley. And then there's this something with anticipations in it. And then there's another one. Um, but those were he was promoting the new Bible. And he was saying that the, this like, you know, world religion, um, the only thing we really need to keep from the old religion is this idea of submission yes but it's not submission in a sense that you understand what you're because there is there is submission right like you have to you do have to have in a certain sense humility right um there's that's not bad to have a uh, humility and to to realize that you are born into a, a a system that is uh has a certain kind of harmonic tuning and that you can't go against that 
you know, and that, that this is what what is, you know, can, explained as like a kind of satanic thing is that you think that you know better than the system that you were born into, but the system is ever perfect. So it's uh, it's like the, the 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 height of pride, you know, to think that it it could be any better. But our system is a loving system, you know, like there's no reason to want to um, go against it. But we always have the ability we're, we're being we were given the ability to be stewards where we can make things better as well. That's what the, the sciences are a tool to actually improve upon things that already exist. So it's not like we're trapped in uh, in that way. We are free to to be creative and, and, and to invoke change. But along with natural law, the, the harmony of the universe. Um, and uh, so with H.G. Wells, he's saying like, yeah, I want to take this concept of submission, but I want it to be that you don't really have a concept of what you're submitting to. I want blind submission. Right. Yeah, he wants, all, he wants he wants subservience. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. people to love their yeah. own enslavement, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, because there's that you could say submission has like a positive quality of devotion, but then the the negative pole would definitely be subservience. Then they want. From mm-hmm. an elite perspective, they're just looking ways that they can turn people into slaves without them realizing they've been turned into slaves. Like friendly fascism. That? that one guy wrote a book called Friendly Fascism, and it's just so mm-hmm. so true. Mm-hmm. And and you see that with the the sciences that the sciences increasingly are becoming the new religion, um, where people just believe in it and it becomes ideological. And when you don't agree with them, they become emotional. Because right. it's an emotional thing. It's not based off of facts and reason and everything. Because, I mean, if it was based off of facts and reason, you would simply just respond to that person saying, like, well, the reason why it's true is because X, Y, Z. But instead, they get uh, emotionally worked up. And there, there is, because there's a frustration, because you're not really able to, to justify some of the conclusions, if not all of the conclusions formed within such a belief system. Um, and it really starts to get into, oftentimes it veers into like, well, I can't believe you're like this, or you must believe in all these other things, you know, and, and things like that. And it gets, it can get very nasty. And it's like, well, why does it have to, to, to go that route? Like, why can't you just address the, the, the subject? Um, so that's increasingly what's happening in, in the science, which is uh, really bad. But, and again, the, the best scientists that are not, um, are not contained by that, end up getting sucked in by the military industrial complex. So people have to be, I think, just aware that that's the system that we're in and it's not it's not benefiting any of us. We could have had much better technological advancement that was actually beneficial to people if we had dealt with what is the corrupting, um, you know, source of control for everything. You know, we have to stop saying that we are all bad because we are living in a sick system Maybe we should address what is making the system sick. Exactly. Well, that's brilliant. You know, that's so true too, because they just want everybody looking at their the effects of globalization, which we've had 50 years to see what that model is all about. Hence, why so many countries are saying enough's enough. We're out. We're not going to get involved with the IMF. We're not going to get involved in any of their debt usury slavery system. Because that's really what I think a lot of the world is just figured out through experience. And it's taken America so long because we had such a strong industrial base. Even though I'm from, I'm from the Detroit area and Flint was one of the first, you know, motor plants to go down in 78. So, yeah, sure, Flint felt it, but not all of Detroit felt it right away. Well, now, instead of plants, we got casinos. And people are back there just, it's it's getting really, really bad. And then the areas they're developing from basically the Wayne State University area all the way to the riverfront, they're de- putting tons of money in that where all the baseball stadiums and, the, you know, just all the entertainment is, of course, right? You got to have cheap entertainment and video games and you'll be happy, right? <laughs> According to Harari, right. <laughs> oh. the Great Reset, who, by oh. the way, his hero is H.G. Wells. <laughs> surprise <laughs> oh my god I, I heard I heard that clip Matt played it and he's like I just we don't know what to do with all of these people and it's like 
why, how did this come to be your, your responsibility? It's like, we just, we don't know what to do with all these people. So we, we thought we might as well just put them on drugs and play video games. And it's like, who, why are you in charge? Like, yeah. you sound like maybe you should be playing, you know, like be on drugs and play video games. It's kind of like what he's already doing, I'm sure, because he views the world in, in such an artificial way. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing is like, we have, um, the good news is, okay, um, cause this might be depressing for some people that, um, they have dumbed themselves down <laughs> this controlling system. So presently it is in a process of internal collapse. And that's the beauty of, if you go against, you know, what is natural law, you will, it will eventually collapse upon itself because you can't you can't be violating too much of natural law and still think that you're going to you know have some kind of dominion or or some kind of like um you know great amount of 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 power or influence over what you're trying to you're trying to organize so um i think that that's very good news and that there's a bit of a an awakening i find that's going on with the rest of the world and what's sad is that um, us in the West were very uh, disconnected from what the voice is of the rest of the world. Um, and um, I do think that there is a final recognition of, of like what are the core problems of what has been causing us to go down this road and that they're addressing them and they're finally in a position too where they, they can say no to the sort of uh, threats that they were receiving before in uh, who were the kind of supremacy in geopolitics up until kind of recently. And so, you know, some people are very scared about this, but you have to think you're living in a world where the suicide and the drug uh, abuse rates and overdoses are through the roof. And it's not because another country is targeting your country. It's because your country has done this to you. Your country has allowed this to happen to you. Um, and, you know, Nixon was a part of a lot of that uh, problem. And, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, it was a clear violation, right, of American rights, not just the Vietnamese people. The Americans were also put through the meat grinder spiritually through yeah. that process because the, the people who came back, they were never the same. And it, it ruined entire communities within the United States. It was completely not necessary. And they exactly knew what they were doing. The Korean War as well was very horrifying, at least with World War II, not to say that that wasn't violent. They thought that they were actually doing something useful, whereas the Korean War and the Vietnam War were highly questionable moral uh, you know, interventions that the United States did in these areas that were supposed to be about security and safety of people. Um, Not to mention the golden triangle of opium drug trading during that yes. era. Right? I mean, that was so huge. And yeah, just, and the Vietnam like War is very market. much, yeah, it ha I mean, had in hand. The black market industries and the elites and these globalists are all intertwined is really something to remember because it's hard it's hard in in for a lot of people especially if they're still caught up in the box of the mainstream to realize that that level of collusion that these are literally like mafia type cartels and families you know mm -hmm. there's definitely people starting to call that out more for what it is like obviously bush bush family is a crime family clinton family is a crime family so mm -hmm. let's just, i think little by little it's starting to become talked about in that way and maybe that's the beginning of shifting the the mass consciousness to realize yeah we got to do something to change this these are not good examples for our children to um idealize because they were the presidents or whatever i had somebody yeah. the, uh, the other day trying to you know give put a shine a positive light on george bush senior and i'm like not gonna happen <laughs> sorry <laughs> I mean, I had to be a little yeah, I bit, know. I had to be gentle because I was at Cordy's table. I didn't want to stir it up, but I wasn't going to just let it go either. And in the no. end, I'm yeah. getting links to some of your sites and, <laughs> and that, you know, like basically I was like, hey, go get educated. I'm not going to go there with you. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the people need to know about Operation Gladio 
um, which was uh, something that was set up by NATO and uh, the CIA played a big role, which assassinated democratically elected leaders in Europe. And, uh, and Kennedy was also a part of that assassination uh, network, um, which, again, I've, I've written about. And But they were also attacking people in Italia, Italy. Uh, that, that was uh, very clear, right, um, with the... Um, uh, I, I don't remember the word in Italian, but it's it's recognized now that that was an Operation Gladio type uh, thing that they suffered through for 20 years. And there were terrorist attacks that were blamed on the communists uh, by NATO um, to try to get people to elect further and further far right wing uh, government. And um Americans need to realize, too, the Eisenhower speech, you know, the farewell address, it's all nice and good and everything. But he says that, you know, there was something there is something awful that he has been growing in this administration and that he has left there for the next president. And what happened to that next president? His brains were splattered on pavement in broad daylight on live television. Like how much more? you know, do you need to, to realize? And that was then. So imagine it, the, the form of control is so much more now. However, like I said, the good news is, is that they've overstretched themselves and they're not very smart. Uh, they've like become dumber and dumber uh, generation to generation, which is, which is great. Um, and I think it's just lawful, right? It, it just makes sense because if you're living um, that way, uh, it, it will just kind of eat away at you, whether you're conscious of it or not, you will be eaten away at. And um, and people just have to realize you still are in a position of power. The United States um, is still uh, the foundation, the founding principles of the United States are still great. They're, they're still uh, exemplar for what other countries should model themselves off of, the founding principles, and uh, very much what other countries are doing right now that are uh, extremely successful as economic practices were first discovered by the United States. And it, that was what launched them into the greatest power in the world and how they were able to uh, really um, overcome the British Empire in uh, economic supremacy, um, anti-slavery. With an anti-slavery economy, they were able to blow the British Empire system out of the water. That's a very uh, proud history to have. And uh, the Americans just need to realize what are the key sources of what is being lied to. Stop getting distracted that other countries are, are ruining you know, the country. Um, it, the country is being ruined by an internal um, coup uh, that had been kind of solidified with the, the assassination of Kennedy. Um, uh, but, you know, the American people have so much strength that if they recognize that there is nothing that can hold back that kind of consciousness, that kind of awakening and understanding. And it, it can be very easily a peaceful, a peaceful thing. It doesn't have to be a bloodbath. So there's so much power in just understanding what the problem is. There is, you know, last night, Fergus um, and I were watching the Putin interviews that Oliver Stone oh, did, and he brought up, I mean, they were great. We, we, what did we do? Watch the first three or something, first two. Um, and Putin says, you know, America is really great at creating enemies. You know, they have to have this other enemy. That's why they're justifying the building up of NATO. It's like, well, look at why NATO was originally formed. Like, are we in a crisis? No, they have to create constant crises to justify the constant like <laughs> growth of NATO because there's some enemy doing something here or some enemy doing something there. Most of the time it's Putin, right? It's Russia. They're our enemies. But that they're really, they are not our enemies. So when we start to see like, well, who is our true enemy? It's the people that are making our country sick, not these outside forces that like the Cold War still exists on some level. It's, you know, it's yeah. just it's that identification of the enemy. Who is the real enemy? I mean, even Cheney said it back after 9-11 uh, and that whole false flag. You know, we're going to have perpetual war forever. You're right. War, but forever. We're just going to, I mean, that's exactly the way these sick people think. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt about it. After a certain point, if that doesn't get people to go, wait a minute, something's not right here, or wait a minute, maybe I should, maybe I should do a little of my own research. Like, I'm not sure what's going to spark people to think in a new way, or even just to be open to thinking that they don't know it all, just because of the way they dumbed them down using that TV. 
I mean, I, I, I'm still a little bit at a loss of the bridge. Like, that's why I was curious about how you made your own personal bridge. I mean, I was asking questions my whole life, so it was easy for me. I just didn't. I was born as a skeptic. There's no way I'm going to. There's, I could, you couldn't sell me a bill of goods, so I was going to yeah. investigate, you know. Well, yeah, I was always uh, in tune with that to kind of like reject just an authoritative line without an explanation. So I had that already at a very young age, um, and I, I, you know, did not make life easy for me by any means. But um, ultimately, it it was very good that I I had that. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows how we're born with these types of dispositions. I have no idea, but I had it in me from a very young age to just not accept, you know, because I told you so kind of a line. <laughs> By the way, Vincent, when I read in your book, um, the, uh, your, your, your line of like how, oh, what is going to be the next thing after this big war with, uh, Russia and China? Is it going to be with the, uh, holographic alien <laughs> invasion or something like that? Yeah. I thought that was I thought that was so brilliant because actually uh, Jake Sullivan in a, in an interview he did in 2019 and for people who don't know Jake Sullivan is kind of like the gold golden boy for Hillary Clinton and um, they're very much involved in like weird alien type uh, you know discussions and so forth he was even saying in this interview that um, well you know we need a force. Uh, that we can all kind of uh, gang up against as the common enemy where the United States can be regarded as the savior of humanity. And he said, well, you know, Independence Day, you know, that movie with Will Smith, that would be actually perfect. That's exactly what the United States needs, you know, to, you know, combat an alien invasion. And you're wondering, like, why is he talking about this in such a weird way? Like, oh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be convenient? It's very detached, right? And, um, you know, I've, I've seen with like the, what is it called? The blue bean uh, thing or... Um, there's like there's this thing now that like there's increased so-called alien sightings and like, you know, you've seen some uh, videos on social media of like, you know, like really long legs, like kind of like War of the Worlds type of stuff, you know, walking in like the middle of the ocean, like people are on a ship going like, what the hell is this? And I seriously and then you have I'm going to just share my thoughts here. They might sound crazy, um, but you have the Marvel comics, which are in line with the military industrial complex. If anyone doesn't know this, I'm sorry to burst your bubble um and uh it was that mysterio the movie with mysterio was all about the holograms uh it's a spider-man it's the spider-man movie and he he would create holographic projections of things and part of it was to make people think there was an enemy that he would fight and that he would always save the day against and it was also to control the narrative right and i was like they're wow. probably thinking about doing this kind of holographic projections of things. Those people think that they're seeing something. I would not be surprised that you're right on the ball, Vincent, with what you said. Um, and I thought immediately, I'm like, you are the only person who has um, said it that way. I'm like, very, very insightful because they need a common enemy. And if they, they won't win this war with Russia and China, right? But they're so arrogant that they're thinking, what are we going to do after we win this war with Russia and China? Well, we'll need the aliens at that point because we will need the military industrial complex to keep growing. Yes. Well, now it's climate change as well, right? That's the yes. big scary yeah. monster that we all have to band together to, to protect against, right? It's just the same stuff. That, that, one, that one's insidious though. You know, like war, yeah. war machinations can be resisted easier you might say but boy that climate change one is almost like the covid hoax i mean you you get under people's do gooderness and they just want to help and come on you're mm -hmm. not recycling or you're not doing this or you can do more and so why are you right. why why don't you have a hybrid yet or or neighbors telling on each other, right? I've seen a bunch of headlines like neighbor reports other another neighbor for using the water when they're not supposed to, or it's like that that same thing that they did during COVID. Oh, where, like, oh this person's having people over. It's like real subtle ways of that just turning on each other and and the yeah. name being good and doing something good for the yeah, world. Yeah, the water situation is so crazy in California. Well, I still have the vision that was on the table in the 19th century. And that means that us in Canada would have to have, I would just love to see Canada just break and become 
one, you know, you know, connected us in such a good way. And we do the water project where we take that rain, excess rainwater from Alaska and British Columbia and through the canals, we refeed the Great Lakes, we refeed the Colorado, we get it down to where it needs to go. To me, that's the most brilliant idea. I mean, even the desal is good, but that gives me a little hard on the ocean and this and that, but it's still viable and it's, and it's there on the table as well. But that one, to me, would, I mean, think of the jobs for both Canadians and Americans right yeah. there. It has nothing to do with the, the British empire, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, can we just get rid of them forever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, like British Columbia, by the way, is named because oh, Canada wow. is the, you know, the the vessel of the British Empire. Still, we don't really have a constitution. The Queen can actually intervene on what happens with our military um, in Canada. But um, yeah, I think that that is a, a very key key issue, and uh, you know, Canadians need to realize that because they're like, oh, the Americans, they always want our water, and it's like most of that water gets run off back into the ocean. Like, what what is the problem here? And it's like, well, the ocean needs it. It's like, are you kidding me? The ocean. <laughs> I know we oh it's like we get, we get people to care more about animals and the oceans than other humans. It's like yeah. what <laughs> we got the ocean is not going to like you know be used up <laughs> based off of this project, you know. Um, but yeah, they they would rather they would rather have this. I've also had um like because it's very uh, contradictory as well. These people who are um very much for the environment um in such a way that the eco they they view that ecosystems should be like non-changing but right. ecosystems change naturally so Definitely. that already doesn't make any sense and so now you're intervening so that an ecosystem doesn't change you're actually intervening on the proper type of thing that that ecosystem should be going through um according to your your idea right so you're just intervening in one way and you're against intervening in another way. That's already contradictory. But they'll say like, oh, you need to uh, plant trees, right? To reduce the uh, carbon dioxide in the world, which is a very efficient way of doing it. Oh, now China and India are the number one uh, tree growers by far. Look at the satellite pictures of this green, 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 all in China and India. And now you have people saying, well, what about the desert ecosystem? <laughs> and it's like, well, these people need water, and also by planting those things, you have a more rich ecosystem, and a desert is going to just spread, spread, spread. So you're going to allow a desert uh, system to spread because of, you know, there not being enough trees uh, for whatever reason in that area. For instance, the, the Sahara, it used to be a green area, you know, um, in the past. And it's like, yeah, no, we need to protect. Uh, protect the desert economy and it's like so anything that used to be there it just should stay there um it's like it becomes impossible to be on the earth and it's like but wait a minute aren't we part of the earth yeah <laughs> aren't I we part I of that ecosystem yeah. if yeah, we yeah. have a universe are, were we put here for a reason don't we have a purpose <laughs> the same thing they did with the native Indians on the reservations. Really, when you think about isolate them and keep them like they're still living 100 years ago. And in Canada, where it's just That's like, oh, I mean. yeah, like, exactly. Like, let's not give them any access to any of the technology or useful things. Let's just preserve them in the name of, like, keeping them in a natural state. But that's not really, like, people want the use of technologies where it makes sense, you know? Yeah, you, well, to Tibet, the, too, right? They're starting, right. Tibet is starting to ask for this. And I've had people I know say, well, the Tibet people don't actually know what what's happening. They're being fooled because they're simple people kind of thing. Yeah. And it's like, it's yeah. just like, you're starting to impose your views, you know, onto everything, and you're not allowing anything to make its uh, its own decisions. And for the native uh, people who uh, are in Canada, they're not even keeping their own ways. The younger generation and the middle-aged generation have lost their language. They don't know how to speak the the Mohawk. Like for instance, there's a, a Mohawk uh, reserve near where we live. Most of them don't know how to speak the Mohawk language. You only have most of the history and the knowledge of the culture from the elders who are, are like going to pass away in like the name. Uh oh, oh, you froze. You froze up. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. And, and they have a. Uh, froze up. 
You froze up. Oh, I, I, it stopped, huh? Yeah, the the internet connection I think is not great where we uh, where we live. So um, yeah, the elders are the ones that have this um, you know memory of the language and the culture and the history, um, and they're the ones that went through the really brutal stuff, right, with the the, the Catholic schools and 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 so forth. With uh, and then were returned uh, back to. I mean, Matt has also done some good work where it sounds like they were just kind of like let loose after this program. They were just like, okay, we're going to just bring, we're going to let you release you back into the wild. Like you're like some kind of wolf or something. It's like, just do what you do in the wilds. And these people grew up in like a Catholic, you know, school system and a lot of them died. And it was like, uh, kind of thing. But um, the reality is that these younger people who are separated from society, um, it, from, you know, the rest of society, pretty much, um, they're still addicted to the same things. But they what's the problematic there is that there's no concept of any kind of hope, or, or like how life could be different. It's like, this is just perpetuality. It, nothing can get better things can only get worse. That's the reality of how people are living in these areas. And it's it's really awful that, you know, well, a lot of the elders are actually not happy with this. And they want, um, you know, certain access to technology and, 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 and so forth. And the news often, like Antifa has actually come in and, and you know, done the protest um, and uh, gone against what the elders have said in uh, the West Coast area of Canada. And uh, the the news press is just not reporting it. Or, you know, like one of the elders, he was quite uh, outspoken about being for uh, development projects. And then there was this other relative vying for power for the position of elder. And he's like, no, no, no. Everything he says is wrong and blah, 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 blah. And because nobody actually knows, like, what is the situation? How do the people think in the uh, area and so forth? They're like, oh, it must be him. This must be a corrupt elder. This elder just wants to do it for the money, uh, the development uh, and everything. So it's so dirty. Actually, Brandy and I, we were invited onto uh, the the Barona Reservation, part of the Kumeyaay tribe in, in, in the San Diego area. And uh, Ethan Benegas invited us out for, it was an honoring of this oral history project he did. He's a historian for the tribe. And... He did 30 interviews with different elders from several different, they're kind of like clans, really. They're, they're all part of the Kumeyaay, but they're all different clans. And, and then one historian. So 31 interviews in this whole set that he put together, which is now available on the reservation for anybody to view it. And even a few people had crossed over since he started doing that, including his own father. And I mean, it was really an it emotional was really great. event. I, I started I mean, watching them, um, and it's just with the elders telling their stories because the yeah, Kumeyaay really had moved from one location to another. So you had some of the elders that were there, not many, but that were there in the original location. One who I remember was four years old when they moved to the new location. Right. And just hearing their stories within the clans, how they dealt with colonialism, how they responded to colonialism, even between the different clans. I mean, it. It was started by Ethan because the elders were dying and he was like, he was trying to study his own history and it was just in people's minds and their memories and there wasn't much for him to study. So uh, kudos yeah. to him. It was amazing to be there around these elders and they were receiving the transcripts of the interviews and um, different organizations that helped fund the project got their transcripts with all the, and their you know US portable USB with all the interviews. And it, it, it's, it needs to be done everywhere, right? But that took him five years of his life. That was the ceremony that we went yeah. to, was the last five years doing 30 interviews. And God, well, God bless him for it because yeah. there is so much memory and, and history in experiences. It's like every person should write their own book. You know, like how do we preserve that knowledge and share it with others? Because it's not just, as we know, all books can be manipulated. So what is the, you have to get a, a widespread base of sources in order to really like formulate what was going on at the time. Yeah, that's why we like to bring it back yeah. to soul because mm -hmm. then you start tapping into soul memory and then you start realizing, wow, I can remember things that happened to me when I was in this lifetime as a child and different things. But when it starts stretching to other lifetimes and you realize that the soul really does have this library of lifetimes 
there for you to explore. And sometimes they show up like a, a past life experience will show up because you are in a relationship with somebody or a work scenario might reflect one or an injury. There's been several times I've had an injury of some sort and then I'd go up to Santa Barbara and hang out with Court and he starts telling me about a past life where I had, you know, lost my arm or something weird. It was, it's been so bizarre. I mean, it really makes you stretch your mind, but memories like that. Like you, yeah, you think like, well, you think you kind of remember and then you realize, wow, there's a lot more I'm not actually remembering. And why aren't you remembering that? Well, you're just not exercising your mind in that way. You're not using certain inner gifts that we all possess and they're just kind of dormant inside many, most people. But then we start using those inner gifts either consciously or unconsciously, you do start to remember more. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's actually just filled with so much discovery and heart-to-heart -heart connection when you do it with another person. I always encourage couples to, yeah, try to go eye to eye and see if you can remember a time you were together. And one of the two people is usually a little more visual than the other person. And they might be the first one to get a sensation or an image. And it can come through so many different ways. It, it doesn't, there's no um, one way to remember. Mm -hmm. right. That's that's big. We definitely have expanded our view on things because of, you might say, this knowledge of soul. And it's part of and, the reason I had to write the book, too. Yeah, and mining our memories. I mean, we do a lot of reflection using different tools like the life cycles. So I like going back, um, right. like kind of like you. I mean, I feel like we're these soul sisters in a way just because I actually broke a little bit later than you because I realized in law school, you know, I wanted to work for the UN and save the world. And then I realized that the UN is just like, just terrible, like satanic organization. And, and like, what am I going to do with my life? You know, like I was, I was going to be a lawyer. I was, you know, graduated and like there's, so there's this, you're, you're, you're out there on your own, but um, like, I like going back and reflecting at times in my life and using some of the tools to kind of and, and our memory to see, well, what was going on? What, where were the forks in the road? Where did I make this choice? How, like, what ages? Like, it's, it's also interesting. And the more I mine and go back to those memories, the more I remember about what I was going through. And it, and it helps me today to, to either process information or just to understand and relate to other people. Because when we mine our own memories, we, share, we can share more experiences with others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I feel, um, you know, I feel a connection with you guys as well. I think it's just such a natural conversation. We didn't end up talking as much about Aldous Huxley as we planned, but I think it's better to have it organic this way anyway, because we still haven't really discussed too much um, with each other. And, and it's just, you know, it's, I think stuff that everyone has on their minds that is in a, it's good when it's more on a personal level too, uh, and, and, and more like, well, this is how I came, you know, to come to these conclusions and, and so forth. And you make it more accessible that way, um, rather than just always trying to expose some of these um, narratives. And there's, you know, there's just so many of them and it can be kind of overwhelming. But um, uh, I think that we're going to probably have a lot of, uh, a lot of conversations in the yeah. And I like starting with the exploration of the mind because I mean, that's really where like we, it's good. It's a good place to start because I think that it gets people really examining how open their mind really is or how, how narrow or where, where are their thoughts? Like I, I think that, you know, our thoughts and our beliefs create our reality. So what, examining our belief systems and our thoughts is essential for anybody on um, a path to, uh, to, to knowledge of self-knowledge or, or knowledge that's different streams of knowledge that are out there. So we'll see where we get to next time. <laughs>